According to my clock, it's the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me just welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum, and Happy New Year. I'm so glad to see all of you in this new and already strange year of 2021. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the Future Trends Forum's creator. I'm the host. I'm the chief uh, cad herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation. I am absolutely delighted to welcome two friends of mine, two colleagues, two people who listen to me with far too much generosity and people who teach me a great deal. I'd like to welcome Eddie Maloney and Joshua Kim. Eddie is at uh, Georgetown University and Joshua is at Dartmouth. So let me just take turns and bring them up one by one. The reason they're here is not only because they're awesome people, they are, but also because they're the authors of a new book, the Low Density University, which is the first scholarly book written about the crisis of 2020 in higher education. It's a fantastic book from Johns Hopkins University Press. If you look in the bottom left of the screen, you'll see a little button where you can click it and learn more. And we'll be have them for the next hour just to see what they think and to ask them all kinds of questions. So first, let me just bring up Josh Kim and we'll get a chance to start talking. Greetings, sir. Hey, Brian, good to see you. Oh, it's great to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. And it's good to see everyone here in, in this uh, time together. Thank you for, for coming. I agree. I agree. There's more than 100 people right now. And uh, Greg Britton just tossed the link to the book uh, into the chat as well. Um, so I'd like to see that. Uh, Josh, I have two questions for you. Um, the first question I have is, looking ahead to the rest of calendar 2021, what are the biggest projects and themes for you uh, going forward? Um, great. So um, it'll be great to hear what, what Eddie has to say. Also, we're, we're not used to doing this separately. So uh, I'll start and then Eddie can come in and say really smart things. But first, I, I just want to acknowledge the, the moment we're in now and how odd it feels in a way to be having this discussion when we're in this midst of this crisis like yeah. we've never seen. And, and I do think to relate it back to the work and what we all do, uh, much of the, the book, this book that, that Eddie and I put together, it, it's about inequality. And it's about the consequences of concentrated privilege and, and how much COVID-19 uh, both re revealed and exacerbated this incredibly uh, unequal society um, and, and the injustices that, that are so inherent. And, and I think we, we've seen the, the outcomes and effects of this in the last um, few days. Mm. And for all of us, this is a time that we very much need to come together and think about the role that higher education needs to play in, in bringing this country together. Um, and, and, and we're so uh, far apart now. So I, I really do want to recognize what a strange and important time we're, we're in now. Indeed, indeed. I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, this is something I'm sure you and Eddie and everybody here uh, will have time to, uh, uh, we have many thoughts about that. Um, you know, thinking about um, introducing you to people, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that you've already revealed yourself is to be a wide ranging and sensitive thinker. Um, let me ask, what's your, what's your current title? At uh, Dartmouth, so I'm the director of online programs and strategy, which is a title like um, I think many of us now have in higher ed, a completely made up title that doesn't really mean anything, and no one ever came before. Um, I think we're we're very much in a time of uh, higher education reinvention. You know, Brian, the things that you've written about for years, the, the, the multiple crises that we're facing. Um, you know, we can talk about economic inequality. We can talk about the, the decline and the erosion of public funding, underfunding of community colleges, uh, demographic headwinds, which, which you've been talking about um, a, a great deal. So I think, um, I suspect that many of us on this, this um, shindig today, whether you're in higher education at a college or outside, you're part of the ecosystem. Yeah. We're all part of this, this kind of very strange and disorienting moment where we know that higher education has to be different, but we're not quite clear what that means. We also know there's an important policy 
element to that. I think a lot of us are looking towards the Biden administration for significant investment in, in public institutions and particularly community colleges. So that's just a long way of saying that I think we're, we all have sort of strange jobs now in higher ed, in the higher ed ecosystem. Well, that's a, that's a really <laughs> all too accurate way of putting it. And I have to agree. I, I have to agree. I also wanted to thank you for having the best background of the year, with your clean background on the clock, reminding us of the time. Uh, and how important it is to think where we are. Well, why don't you hold on for a second and let me bring up your colleague and your uh, co-conspirator, Eddie Maloney. Hello, Eddie. Hey, Brian. Hey, Josh. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see everyone. That's great to see you. Did you uh, did you reverse your uh, camera angle or switch sides of the room? Nope, this is the normal. Am I which which direction am I facing? North, south? Well, normally I see your bookshelves on the other side of the screen. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I've been seeing it backwards all this time. And didn't know it. Hmm. Yeah, uh, well, happy New Year, and uh, thank you for coming, Eddie. Um, thanks for having me. It's good to it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation, um, despite as. Uh, Josh said the difficulty and the kind of moment that we find ourselves in, um, certainly a challenge to be in the DC area right now and kind of watch everything unfold a couple miles from, from my house. You got it. Well, that's mad. Um, are you, uh, you and George are safe and sound? Yep. Everyone is, everyone is fine. I think we're all doing okay. Good, good. Well, let, let me ask uh, the question that I, I put to uh, Josh a few minutes ago. Uh, looking ahead uh, beyond this week, if we can do that for a moment, uh, what the what are the big projects, the big themes, the big uh, efforts that loom largest for you personally, Eddie? What are you going to be working on through 2021? Um, yeah, it's a great question. So I, I think I would I want to come back to what Josh said, which I think is a really Im important um, place to begin that uh, that conversation about I think what we're all trying to think about going forward. I think there's obviously the stuff that's in, immediately in front, of, in front of many of us as we think about how we prepare for the spring, how we try to make sure that the spring uh, is as effective, as engaging, as meaningful as possible for our students while we still find ourselves in a complex hybrid um, of, you know, in-person, remote, high flex hybrid, you know, asynchronous, synchronous modes and trying to make sure that that experience for our students and for our faculty is as uh, meaningful as possible. Um, but I, but I also think, you know, many of us are trying to think about what that post pandemic moment looks like, um, what the new normal becomes, how we think about, um, higher education, whether that's post pandemic because we're living with the pandemic, um, more successfully or it's post pandemic because we've somehow addressed this better and we're trying to understand, uh, how we respond to the lessons learned, um, from this moment, from these, what will be at that point, probably, 18 months, maybe 14 to 18 months of, of time where that we've spent trying to think through this new, this new normal, um, or this, at least this period of time. Um, and what that means for us as we move forward, um, you know, I think is, is on my mind. It's on Josh's mind. We're trying to write uh, another book uh, along those lines. We're trying to think about what that looks like to imagine the future of residential education that brings together a lot of these pieces and um, tries to understand how we respond to and, and learn from this moment. But it also, I think, um, is, a, is an opportunity to try to think about where we are right now, to think about the questions that Josh raised around equity um, and access, which are crucial, but also to think about what kind of brought us to this moment in our country and um, some of the kind of um, polarization that we have that requires us, I think, to probably fully interrogate some of our uh, expectations, assumptions, and our understandings of, of people who think differently than us. And yeah. that's part of the job of higher education is to, to really try to tackle and um, unpack assumptions that we all share. Um, my sense is that going forward, we're gonna have to do that in two ways. We're not only gonna have to um, help at a curricular level, think about um, what it means to help our students unpack assumptions and kind of start to reinvest in um, new ways of thinking, but also at, at the higher ed level, just as kind of institutional and as a kind of ecosystem of, uh, of schools, colleges, universities, um, to really unpack some of the assumptions that have driven higher ed forward um, for the past few hundred years. And so that 
you know, I think is part of the job as well. And so both at a kind of content and at a structural yeah. level, we have a lot of work to do to unpack, to deconstruct assumptions and, and to try to build something that um, plays off of, leverages, understands where we've come from, but also offers, offers a, a new kind of future. That's really well said. Um, I'm tempted to say, well, thank you for coming. And uh, that's, that's, I mean, everything from our assumptions, our structures, our curriculum to our, our way we think about our education seems to be uh, all up for grabs right now. Uh, and we're rethinking this very carefully. Let me just commend both of you for this book, Logan City University, as well as for your previous collaboration on innovation in our education. Those books give all of us good tools for uh, proceeding with mobile. Uh, friends, I have uh, a, a few questions to put to my authors, but I would like you to start surfacing your questions as well. Uh, if you've had a chance to read Low Density University, uh, to spring off of that. If you haven't had, um, to respond to what our authors have just said or what you've heard about the book. Uh, this space is all for you and your questions and thoughts. And before I could say anything more, uh, we already have a question. Uh, this is from uh, Michael Meeks, coming to us from Louisiana State which is probably pretty comfortable right about that in some ways. Michael uh, asks us briefly, what do you believe is the major purpose of higher education? Is it about the experience, solving polarization, learning, wondering what they mean to deliver a meaningful experience? 15 seconds each. No, no. 15, 15 seconds each. All, yeah, of, the all of the above. Um, a fantastic question. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I, I think there are pithy, um, maybe obnoxious answers that, that each of us could give um, about you know, what the purpose of higher education is. It's complex. It's a complex system. It's trying to accomplish a lot. It's um, the, the president of Georgetown University likes to talk about higher education in, in three ways, which I think are actually useful and meaningful. It's the formation of, of young women and men. Um, it is the uh, creation of new knowledge and it's the contribution to the common good. Um, and that, you know, you can extend out in a variety of different ways and you can think about what that means in your context and so on. But higher education as a way of both learning, of creating new knowledge and then doing good while you're doing that. And um, I think that that's probably right. Um, but when you get down to what higher education means for individuals, what does it mean for society? Um, there are a lot of different purposes for it. Um, one that I talk about often, uh, that Josh has heard me talk about anyway often, that I think is really important is that it buys time. It buys time for us to grow, it buys time for us to learn, it buys time for us to spend um, with others, uh, it buys time for us to reflect. Um, it's it's an expensive time. It's not a cheap time at all. It, it buys time for us to have conversations with people who are often smarter than us, and um, we can engage in both flights of fancy, and we can engage in the practical and the purposeful and the philosophical. All of those things um, become part of, at least in my mind, um, what higher education is trying to do. So, so, so Brian, I, I'd like to turn that around a little bit back onto this community and really ask a question, what is the role of higher education in this moment? And I have a very specific question to this community here uh, in this moment. Um, we've heard a lot of calls, um, a lot of really eloquent statements from leadership, um, higher education about um, the need to, to come together and, and what, what we saw at the Capitol is not, not acceptable. Um, I wonder at this time, do we really need to be calling that 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 this president needs to go? Do, do we need to say unequivocally, um, th th this is not acceptable, and we need to stand up that 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 we need to invoke the Twenty Fifth Amendment? He needs to leave. Is this a time to make those kind of strong statements and to really insert ourselves and in, into um, this debate? And I'd be really interested what you what Eddie and what, what, what everyone in this, this hour thinks about that, because that is all that I'm thinking about right now. But to be clear, Josh, you mean, should higher education call for the president? Should, should, should leaders of higher education be, be making strong, unequivocal statements about where we are now? We, we've seen this from some um, organizations. We've seen this from certainly some political leaders. Um, I'm not quite clear where, where leaders of higher education or organizations have fallen on this question today. I just haven't been able to keep up because of life, but I'd be interested in speak, talking about that question today with this, if you would allow that with this group here. I think it's a great question. Uh, and let me just put this to, and before I can say anything, we've already had the, 
two responses from the chat. Uh, we've had one that said yes, and one said absolutely not. Uh, one says, I don't think this is the most important issue at the time. And uh, another says that teaching cannot be neutral. Uh, as public intellectuals, we have an obligation to work for equity. Uh, so let me give you all uh, a few minutes if you, or a few seconds if you'd like to write more in the chat. If you'd like to join us on stage, just click the raise hand button um, and I can bring you up to respond to Josh right away uh, or click the uh, Q&A box and uh, type in a comment there. Uh, we already have a stack of questions uh, piling up, uh, but this is a really, really crucial one. Um, so uh, let's see, we have uh, more in the chat. Uh, a Canadian uh, friend and previous guest of the program says, uh, I think the time to make strong, unequivocal statements was a year or two ago. That's Stephen Downs. Um, Michael Meek says we should listen better. Uh, Mark Lentini, Mark, uh, I think we need more. For, I think I just got a fragment that you got cut off. Uh, Sarah San Gregorio says teaching is inherently political work. We have the responsibility as scholars to engage in work as a public intellectual. What frustrates me is there seems to be a disconnect between the business of higher education in a mission of higher education. Uh, this task, uh, Karbari, and please forgive me if I mispronounced your name, asks, if not now, when? If not us, who? Uh, Linda J. Goldberg adds, yes, everyone concerned with health and democracy should press for consequences with the 25th Amendment as the top of choices. So rather than impeachment, uh, the 25th Amendment by which the cabinet and then the Congress can rule President Arthur for office. Uh, you've clearly hit a, hit a, a nerve, Josh. Um, and there are more questions coming in. Mike, there were more responses. Uh, Michael Meek takes a counter view. There's a need to say to half the population that they must bow to our supreme ivory tower position. Uh, Mark Lentini's, uh, thank you, Mark. Mark says, uh, if we adopt Georgetown's president's guidance to support the common good, college presidents could weigh in on the role of race in this debate. That's very precise. Our response. Lisa Berry says, I'm here to think about the future of higher education and these experts' insights about exciting and promising models. And she smiles. So that's a sign uh, of, of all topics to, be, to address. And uh, Margie Ricks observes that the 25th Amendment at this time adds more division. Uh, so it looks just as a quick glance, it looks like the majority of, of uh, participants who are sharing their thoughts uh, support this idea, Josh, to various forms. Uh, some do not, and then there's different uh, ways of thinking about it. Uh, Steve Ehrman, a wonderful, wonderful person, uh, adds this thought, and we share this with you all, for us to make this a teachable moment, engage with the university community and reasoning with evidence about what's acceptable, what's not, or whether the invaders of the capital were domestic terrorists. And before we go on with that, Michael Meeks comes back and asks for the 25th Amendment for Biden and Hunter. Why not wait till facts are in? Emotions are not how we are trained as scientists. So what a great question, Josh. And uh, thank you everybody for a whole slew of answers. Um, and some more are still coming in. Josh, did you, Josh or, or Eddie, did you want to respond to those uh, responses? Hey, what do you think, Josh? To me, this feels like a, a moment where higher education and the leaders of higher education, both at institutions, foundations, leading companies, um, professional associations, um, foundations, I think need to take a stand. And, and to me, what that stand needs to be is clear. Um, I know not everyone will agree, but to me, this, this crossed lines that, that um, were just so far beyond um, pales of, of normal or acceptable behavior. So, so yes, I, I, I do, but of course, you know, I, this is what we do in higher education is we have open and respectful debate as you're modeling, Brian, we, we listen to each other, um, you know, to try to bring it back to, to the book, what Eddie and I were trying to do in 15 scenarios, um, and it's really nice to have Brian, your editor and our editor, uh, Greg here, um, as he hears about our next book, but we, 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 we tried to not say, this is how schools should um, respond to the pandemic. That wasn't our response. We, we, we tried to put up a, a range of, of scenarios, 15, and, and that was Eddie actually got us to 15, and gives the pros and cons and, and try to um, get a place for a respectful debate so we could listen to each other, but listen to each other with some 
frameworks, context, facts, information. So we, we actually had a, a, um, a, a conversation where we're all speaking the same language. So it, it's nice in this environment to have respectful debates, but I, I, I think I'm pretty clear about w what I think, but again, I, I'm always listening. Which is great. That's well modeled. Uh, we have uh, one more comment that came in from uh, Emily Daniel Magruder. Certainly we should perform and engage students in close readings of our governing documents and relevant historical precedents. It's interesting to see different disciplines and different disciplinary approaches modeled so far. We've had science evoked and now this is uh, literature and, and history, I believe. Um, uh, Rachel K. Neimer, or Neimer, says that one of the purposes of higher education here was to create a well-informed citizenry to help our democracy succeed. Yesterday was evidence of our democracy sliding away. We aren't meeting one of our goals if we don't speak out. And I mentioned disciplines. Uh, Ellen Nuffer offers a law school perspective. Conversations, topics, etc., should always relate to the curriculum. How would this be connected to learning goals? Critical. So we have a step back with just storming with questions. Uh, let me let me turn this back to uh, uh, to both of your work, if I can. And by the way, just one more note. In case you all aren't impressed enough by Josh and Eddie as thinkers and provocateurs, um, not only do they write really good books, but also somehow on the side, Joshua writes roughly 700 columns an hour for Inside Higher Ed. Um, and so I just want to recommend that you follow his columns because they're always, always good and thoughtful. Let me connect your question, Josh, with uh, how Eddie laid this out. Um, if, if one of the goals of higher education is to have this public good, but it's also the good of time uh, that we give people the time to respond, to reflect, to think deeply, uh, and to learn in ways that are often very time consuming, like learning a language or learning mathematics, and not something that can be done overnight. Do these two contradict each other? Would uh, our response be, as a Tolkien character says, too hasty? Uh, would it go against our temporal nature? Uh, or is this crisis so unusual, so striking? and so meaningful that we should speed up our clocks. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I share Josh's opinion on this uh, generally in terms of taking a stand and needing to, to be clear. I think there's there's a, an, an, a moment that has a, a, you know, we're in a kind of emergency space right now, a very short period of time. I, I think it's a it's a different question and a different problem if this was to extend out in a different kind of way, whether it's the 25th Amendment or it's an impeachment um, that's quick and clean, but something that actually tries to to make sure that the person who is causing irreparable harm to our institutions is not able to do so in the same venue in the same format seems like a different kind of problem than do I have, do I have an opinion about this person? Do I have an opinion about um, this person's politics or style or tone or something? And, um, and that the fact that he seems willing to try to burn things down as he um, scurries out um, is I think a, it's just a different kind of problem. And so not to me that dissimilar that when we had to go into emergency remote mode in the sense of we had a problem, we have an emergency, we need to make a decision quickly, and it's not necessarily a decision that we would normally make under different kinds of circumstances. So it, part of the answer that I would make to your question, Brian, is that, you know, sometimes we have the luxury of time and college, I think, um, you know, and this is this is a privileged position to argue for in, in many respects, and I recognize that, and I, I would always want to complicate it. Um, but that luxury of time is not something we always have, and college is often a privileged space. Um, and so to recognize that, that, that it's not always the same as the needs or the immediacy that might be in front of us in a, in a difficult um, and challenging uh, moment. So. Thank you. That's not an easy answer. Okay. But I do, can I, I, I would just also say, you know, this is complicated. It's complicated for all of us. And I think it's, you know, we all, I'm sure, have versions of, of different politics and different ways of thinking about this. I do think it's the job of higher education to try to unpack that. And I do think it's the job of higher education to try to 
push on our assumptions, as is the word I used earlier, and I'll continue to use it. I think we all approach what we think is right and what we think is wrong um, from a, a collection of experiences and stories that we tell ourselves and have been told and ways in which we interpret what's happening in the world. And it's important for us to, to turn that lens on ourselves as much as it is we, um, we find ourselves turning it on others that we disagree with. That in, in many respects is going to be the challenge of trying to figure out how we work together, come together, um, if there's any hope of um, creating some bridge between the divide that we find ourselves in this kind of tribal moment, it is going to be that we we recognize some commonality and we're willing to um, we're willing to, to to say that we don't know everything, um, that we're not necessarily always in the right, um, and that we can be as uh, myopic in our perspectives as anyone else, even when we think and feel we are fully justified and right in everything we're doing. Because everyone on the side that we're not on thinks the exact same thing, thinks they are justified for in the in the, w the ways that they believe. And we often just take the arrogant position that we are the ones who have the truth. Um, and that's problematic as well. And so it's not, it's not, it, it's not a great place to be, but it is an illustrative place um, in many respects for the value of higher education and what we need to do in order to unpack um, unpack this moment and break it down. There was an interesting post by David Brooks, who I rarely agree with beyond kind of a surface level statement of something. But um, every time, you know, there's there's all sorts of problematics in my politics with his. But um, a, a couple of weeks ago about education and whether or not education could help us. <laughs> get to a place where we could um, address some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, in, in particular, he, he raises the issue of diversity and that training and education doesn't necessarily help people uh, become uh, better responsive to issues of equity and, and diversity. Um, but it's a very, very narrow and limited notion of education that he's working with. Education as a kind of didactic model that is trying to tell people how to think, which is the problem that we often have in the politics that we um, espouse. We try to tell other people how to think um, rather than trying to help people um, listen and unpack and explore. And you know, I think to Josh's, Josh's point, that's where we need to be and that's what we need to be investing in in education. But uh, David Brooks in the New York Times this morning? It was uh, last Sunday, not this past Sunday. I think, I think that's right, um, uh, yeah. Thanks. I'll look for that. Um, as shocking as that may be, I'll, I'll look for that. Um, yeah, no, I already saying. A whole stack of questions have come in, and one video question. So I'd like to bring in uh, Tony Sindelar, who's from the MGH Institute of Health Professions. He's an instructional designer there. And uh, Tony has a question. So let me just bring him up on stage. Hello, sir. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi. Um, so, you know, I was I was brought into the world of higher education in, in my career, which is the only, only world I've, I've worked in professionally, uh, strongly believing in that, you know, the role of higher education in uh, reducing uh, inequality, uh, perhaps uh, starting with kind of thinking about economic inequality and job opportunities. Uh, but, you know, the more I, I look into it, it's, it's I, I guess I get very cynical and despair about kind of uh, historically how much uh, uh, higher education has been either complicit or active in uh, propagating inequality. And I think I get particularly cynical about the role of our kind of elite prestigious uh, schools in, in kind of their role in that. So I guess I'm just, I don't know, my question is kind of like, how real are our, 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 our elite schools that kind of take up a lot of space in our culture? I always think about how how many, uh, how many much ink gets spilled over Harvard versus say, community colleges in general in the newspapers. Uh, and that, you know, are, are, are we even on the path to being real given how much at those schools is uh, limited in terms of access, in terms of cost, in terms of the culture that's replicated in those places? That's a great question, Josh. Yeah, it, it, it is a great question. Um, and, and, you know, Eddie and I struggle with, with trying to think about the, the whole spectrum, um, the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. of higher education, um, and given how, how diverse it is. Um, you know, I'd say a couple of things to that. Um, I mean, the first thing is that it, it's clear that, that, that nowadays people bringing up these questions are both um, 
professors, but also people like you, non-faculty educators, people from all different roles who, who are, are coming into higher education in the middle of the higher education education mission, get into it for reasons like you've got into it because uh, believe in the mission, believe that higher education is an engine for opportunity, and then are really starting to question is higher education, um, is it an engine for reducing inequality or is it a system for for propagating a very unequal system to make you okay. and and i think this is a question that has been asked for a long time uh, the difference now is that that more of us who are in more diverse roles are asking that so i appreciate brian giving a space a stage literally okay. for, for for people like us to come in and debate that i guess the second thing i'd say is that for all of our schools what makes up our schools are people like without the people, the schools mm -hmm. don't <laughs> don't don't exist. So you know, I I would look to broadening the, this conversation with as many folks uh, uh, as as many different types of institutions as mm -hmm. possible. And you know, I do I do have hopes with the Biden administration that their Department of Education will start to to actually be a convener to bring folks from community colleges and research institutions and and um, I mean all all types. We, we saw that. Um, a, a great deal with, with the Obama administration. And over the last four years, that's totally been gone. Like the Department of Education has played no role in bringing our community together to, to try to advance that. So, you know, to bring it back to kind of policy and where we are now, um, I, I do think that this is an opportune time to really address some of the questions that you're asking. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you very much. I'm really glad uh, you asked that. Uh, friends, this is, if you're new to the forum, uh, that's how video questions work. You see it's that easy to bring people up. So if you'd like to join us and follow in Tony's footsteps, just click the raised hand button. Um, but there's also a stack of Q&A buttons or Q&A questions here. Uh, so I'd like to make sure folks get a chance to ask these. So let me start bringing up a few of these. Um, one of these comes from uh, April Whalen uh, at Austin Community College. And Austin asks, I'm aware of significant discrepancy in my institution between the demographic composition of our student body and that of the faculty today. How pervasive are such discrepancies nationally? That, that's a great question. I, one of you might have a better answer than I, I actually don't know the, the data at that level of detail between the faculty demographics and the student demographics at every institution. So I couldn't quite say, but my guess is that um, given the previous question, which I think was an excellent question, a lot of the people who are teaching <laughs> at all levels of institutions um, throughout the country are coming from a smaller select group of institutions, right? So they're probably already going to, at least intuitively, I would say they're already going to be um, different generally than the demographics of the institutions that they happen to be teaching in, unless you're only talking about that kind of small elite, um, higher educational kind of space where there's just like insular kind of exchange between people who are learning there and teaching there. Yeah, I, I would say uh, that's pervasive. And just to riff on the question and bring it back to the, the book and COVID, um, Eddie and I, we, we spent a lot of time trying to understand the, the unequal and unequal effects of the pandemic on people in our community. We talk about, about um, students who have the, the, the least advantaged students um, had or carried the most weight and um, the most challenges with remote learning. We also talk about about faculty and and just how much the um, for for adjunct faculty for for um, faculty who are not tenure track um, those those faculty uh, are of course um, disproportionately women um, dispar disproportionately underrepresented minorities. Um, and, and how much more of the burden that they, they've borne in, in during the past nine months. Um, we also just, just know this, that that um, for, for faculty who are women who have um, really had these, these dual kind of roles of, of keeping everything going and so much of, of the household stuff. And, you know, that's true for, for, for everyone, but certainly it seems disproportionate with women. So I, I think we have real structural inequalities um, that, that COVID has really exposed to, to a great ex extent. What, what you're seeing at your institution is, I think, the national story. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, just, just to add, there's a, a couple of differences as well. Um, if you can think that a uh, growing proportion of students are first generation college students, whereas a lot of faculty and staff are not, um, that uh, faculty uh, tend to be uh, wider in the population 
uh, roughly the same in terms of Asian background, but less uh, Latinx, less Black, less uh, Indigenous, at least in the United States. Um, there may be a geographical difference as well. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Great, great question. And, and friends, at a meta level, if you're, if you're new to the forum, that's a great example of a text question. Uh, and we have more examples coming, including one from a former guest and longtime participant, Kelly Walsh, the College of Westchester. Uh, Kelly asked, what are your thoughts on what might be the most meaningful long-term changes to higher education that will arise that we've experienced during the pandemic? During the pandemic. Uh, I, I'll be interested where Eddie says, we're we're talking about almost nothing but this question as, as Eddie and I are trying to scope out our next book um, and trying to get the proposal ready for, for Greg, who I see, um, we're working <laughs> hard on that. So I think that is the question of the hour is, is what we will take away, what, what higher education will learn from, from COVID-19, um, where we will actually go from here and, and are we truly at an inflection point? I, I just want to throw it over to Eddie to, to uh, say some things about that. Thanks, Josh. I um, appreciate that. Um, so I think the 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 argument, uh, well, I know the argument that we're trying to make, and the argument I think that kind of lends itself, broadly speaking, to what we we need to to think about as we move into the kind of post pandemic world in higher education, is that a lot of the things that we see happening um, as significant challenges to higher education, the value proposition, the cost uh, challenges, uh, cost inflation challenges, um, the value proposition in relationship to um, cost, but also in relationship to the experience and the education that students are getting. So um, kind of thinking about the, the potential for uh, students who are going to be coming into a workforce dominated by AI and so on and try and what higher ed's role is in trying to prepare students for that. And, and then thinking about questions of equity and diversity and thinking and access and trying to understand the inequities that continue to be developed in higher education and trying to understand higher education's kind of relationship to um, a changing workforce and, and clearly now a changing understanding of civics and our responsibility to each other in society and so on. All of those as a set of um, significant challenges, changing demographics and so on, um, I think are things that we all are recognizing, we're all trying to, to struggle with. And one of the things that we learned in the pandemic moment, um, uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a phrase for this moment soon that we're gonna all grab onto, but um, one of the things that I think we've learned is that um, when all is said and done, um, and Josh has used this uh, this analogy when you kind of uh, brush away the, the the dust from you know the uh, kind of skeleton that you're looking at and trying to understand, um, it all kind of comes back down to teaching and learning. It comes back down to the relationship between um, educators and students and. Uh, my sense and the sense of I think the book that we're trying to put together is that. The problems that we see that higher ed is facing writ large, all the ones that I just um, mentioned briefly by name, can be addressed in part, not necessarily wholly, but um, can be addressed in part by a renewed attention and emphasis on teaching and learning, by understanding learning um, at the core of what institutions are trying to accomplish and trying to do. It doesn't mean that that's the sole solution, but that we can't solve those problems without understanding how we're teaching our students and how our students are learning. We can't address them in, in meaningful ways without actually trying to invest more deeply uh, in what it means to, uh, to have rich uh, teaching and learning experiences. And that it, it, everything else that we do in higher ed is important. So, you know, I, got, I mentioned buying time and certainly the, the co-curricular experiences and the entire um, context is important as well and they all need to be part of it. But we've we've invested a lot in those without necessarily paying as much attention to the teaching and learning space, um, and we think that that's um, that that's key. And so it seems maybe potentially obvious, and there are a lot of things that that follow from that. But things like what's the role of digital um, in higher education, teaching and learning as we move forward? What's the role of the institutional structures in relationship to teaching and learning? What's the role of institutional strategy around growth um, if, if it actually takes into consideration teaching and learning and so on? Those are the things that we think are, I think, fundamentally part of the next stage here, that it's a, it's a renewed emphasis on teaching as the kind of core of what we do in higher ed. What should be an obvious 
an obvious point, but um, I think often gets lost. That's fantastic. What a great step forward. What a great, if you will, silver lining that we would focus more on uh, teaching and learning. Let me say nothing about that except to thank, thank you for that wonderful answer uh, because we have more questions that are coming up and I'm trying to put them together into shapes that are uh, especially well suited to each other. This is a, a question from Steve Ehrman. Um, Steve, I'm glad that uh, you can be here for this. He asks, um, does your institution's curriculum make it likely that most or all students have to grapple with civic engagement? I guess that's a, that's a question, obviously, Josh and, and, and Eddie, for you, um, but also for those who would like to add uh, uh, more, uh, what kind of responses you see? I, I mean, I'll just start here, but would be get, I mean, I mean, Eddie and I both come from liberal arts institutions and many people today are from institutions, um, liberal arts institutions, where, where that's, that's core into the values of, of what an education is. And, and I think one of the things that Eddie and I talk about is while, while we very much hope that, that higher education prepares our students to be gainfully employed. I have a daughter who's a junior in college and, and uh, one who just finished, and I want them, their college education to lead to um, employment. But we, we don't want to get to a point where we're an education that is, that is broad and engages the kind of questions that Steve's asking. Um, we, we don't want to have that be just for the privileged few. And, and the, the worry that we have is that the way the trends are going, that, that a, a liberal arts education will, will, will be a, 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 for only the, the privileged minority and that we're not doing what we need to do to invest as a society. Um, and, you know, just to bring it back to, to the present moment, I think this is one thing that happens if you don't make the, these investments in, in education at every level, you end up with this polarization that we have. We, we don't have what Eddie was talking about. Um, a generation, a population that that is trained to listen to each other, to try to make evidence-based decisions, to think broadly, to take other perspectives. Um, there, there, there's a real danger. So I, I do, I do hope we grapple with this as a as a community. I wonder if the side effect will be. Uh, I mean, it's a little. We're still in the middle of things, but uh, to think about if we'll have uh, more college curricula, more university curricula, do more of that. Also, yeah, hopefully, but I also think we'll, we'll start to see some change in what it means to actually educate people to think in civic-minded ways. So, for example, I think we're all, in many institutions, trying to understand what the role of data literacy happens to be in the curriculum. It's not something that, you know, probably plays a significant role in a lot of institutions, but we'll probably need to. And that sense of data literacy will have a significant impact on how we think about our engagement at a civic level because so much of what we're doing is informed by information that's coming through algorithms, the information that is being filtered through you know, different kinds of data structures. And without that sense of data literacy, we actually don't have a good sense of civic uh, engagement that we might need or might think that we're actually helping our students understand if we're giving them you know, a relatively archaic notion of, of civics today. So. Ah, that's a good point. There's a sting in the tail there, Eddie, uh, about archaic curricula. Um, but to, to follow up on the liberal arts angle, we have a question from Whittier College, the other end of the continent, from Andrea Rain, who asks, uh, liberal arts college, liberal arts is a part of a higher ed that's been in crisis for some years. The crisis only made more intense by the pandemic. What kind of recovery or new directions do you foresee for liberal arts institutions? Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, it's, uh, well, partly the reason it's been under attack and it's been um, declining is this, I think, growing sense that the relationship between higher education and the workforce is necessary and crucial. And so you're, the argument that it's really about creating a kind of vocational model of higher education that is giving students the experience and the expertise they need to go out and get particular kinds of jobs. And those jobs have narrow skill sets uh, in many respects. Um, they could be highly technical, they could be incredibly um, complicated skill sets, but they're generally relatively narrow. Um, I think um, there are you know, plenty of people who've made this argument, so this is not me. Um, Ayun spoke robot proof is probably a good place to go to take a look at this, but this idea that um, 
in the future, those narrow skill set jobs, those ones that are highly technical, for example, that require certain kinds of uh, expertise in math and engineering and so on, will be more likely to be um, adopted by AI rather than some of the, the skill sets that are more aligned with liberal arts. And so we, we may find ourselves at this particular moment in time at a place where liberal arts is devalued, but we will need to get back to a place where we understand that that is probably at the core of the kind of um, educational experience that will make students, that will allow students to um, be productive, to, to contribute to society in ways that um, cannot be taken over by uh, machines, um, at least that's, that's, that's one argument. I think even if that's not the argument and that's not the sort of dystopic direction you wanna take um, the future of the workforce, you can, I, I think, look pretty carefully at um, different countries that have adopted um, highly STEM-based uh, curricula for their institutions of higher education and have left to the side the liberal arts and the humanities um, in ways that have come back to be incredibly detrimental, not only to the success of the students, but the success of students in those STEM fields. Um, but if they're not as well-rounded um, and not fully understanding questions of ethics and philosophy um, and core issues of history and civics and the things that are fundamentally um, humanities-based, then they're poor um, developers, they're poor engineers, they're poor um, scientists. And those are things that um, always should be part of, uh, hopefully we agree, um, any education, even if it, it's focused in, in kind of uh, less uh, fields, less associated with uh, liberal arts institutions. So. In that case, let me take the moderator's privilege and, and insert one of my own questions very, very quickly. Do you think that the result of the past year's crises, the political crisis, the epidemiological crisis, the social crises, do you think that we will become more interdisciplinary as a whole? I mean, this is a big, big macro question. Or do you think we will dig in and become even more wedded to our disciplines? So, so, so I just like to bring this to the, the current moment. Um, the, the vast majority of all students who are educated in a liberal arts tradition go to public institutions. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't think we can underrate, you know, what happened in Georgia, <laughs> you know, just yesterday that, that with, with, the, with the Senate um, now being 50-50 and, and um, the chance that um, Biden's policies can actually have a chance of, of moving through, there's this opportunity for public higher education to get significant investments, which means significant investments in liberal arts education. Um, it doesn't quite answer your question, but I do want to get to this, that I really do think all of us um, in this space and in higher education have a responsibility to advocate that this happens. Um, we actually, the, the table has been set, but it won't happen unless all of us actually really push it and, and advocate um, to, to get there. So it really does come down to, to funding in a way, and our public institutions have been so starved of funding um, yeah. for, for so long now that these values that we all hold in common, it's very difficult to push forward with no money. Uh, Michael Meeks asks, how do we pay for it? Debt is now insane. Um, well, that was my privilege, but let me withdraw my privilege because we have better questions that just come in. I'll make sure we get in before we're almost out of time. Uh, Nina Huntman at EDX, where she's a VP of Learning, asks, uh, how do we work thoughtfully against the false dichotomy between low-density vocational and high-density liberal arts so that we can avoid reifying the current privileged access to the humanities? Hey Nina, it's good to see you. Um, it's uh, yeah, I think that's that's an important question. I think you start to draw uh, important relationships between the two. Why they both inform each other, and as Brian was saying, kind of an interdisciplinary approach becomes possibly the most successful approach. Um, you can show why uh, liberal arts are important to the more technical vocational, and why the vocational become valuable for people who are invested in thinking in the kind of uh, kind of core liberal arts. So how do you do that? Um, well, <laughs> through education, I think is how you do that, through, through creating curricula that actually are intentionally trying to understand the relationship between the two of those rather than segmenting them off. I mean, it's just, in some ways it's as simple as that and it's as complex as that as, as anyone who's tried to think about curricula at any institution knows that's not a, that's not a simple thing to do. But we find ourselves in this moment where we might be able to, um, I, I, I hate um, to, to 
think about terms like leverage and even silver lining phrases like silver linings and, and whatnot at the opportunities that we find ourselves in to to create change from but certainly it's a moment to be reflective um it's a moment to, to to think about where we are and what we're missing because things are changing and will likely change going forward and if they're going to change um ideally leaders who are at, at institutions that um, may be vulnerable um, or maybe want to be innovative and forward thinking should be doing so intentionally then rather than reactively and should be doing so with an idea that there are some values that they want to invest in even if those values are about differentiating themselves from other institutions which um, may very well be the, the possibility uh, uh it's a i think it's the case um arguably anyway that the large majority of our institutions follow fairly limited um, models of what higher ed can be. And, and maybe that will change. Um, and therefore you could get to a place where you could start to break down that dichotomy. But it's a, it's a hard thing to, to shift. And I'll just take it back to my the point where I started. It's a hard thing to shift because of time. Um, time is expensive for buying time and you wanna do a lot in that time. And um, how you do that and how you how you actually get students to to make choices that allow them to see that complexity is hard well said thank you uh both of you uh one quick question i just put this into the chat uh I, the discussion in the chat box and the questions that have come in and questions have been extremely proliferating <laughs> there have been so many of them it's hard to we can't get to them all today uh if anyone objects to me publishing them to the web as a blog post after this please let me know uh, I can anonymize names easily, um, but I don't want to lose all the richness. We will, of course, have a video uh, conversation. Just, just put it in the chat uh, or directly, contact me directly. Uh, we have a question that comes in from the uh, suspended Christine Wolf Eisenberg. Uh, it's actually, uh, and I, she clarified the question, so let me just put it up quickly. In response to the impact of the pandemic on instructional continuity and approaches, do you anticipate any long term changes to how PhD students? are prepared for academic jobs. And, and she qualifies this by she's asking, will our emphasis shift more towards teaching as opposed to primarily or exclusively research? Does that, does that work? So, so I'll, I'll try to just quickly, I know we're running out of time. You know, Christina, th thank you um, for that question. It's good, good to see you. Um, I mean, none of this is set in stone. The, the, the answers to those questions will depend on conversations like this where people like us who um, have our stakeholders or, or some impact in how this is done answer that question so um, who knows right but but the <laughs> but what will determine this is, is how we all decide together as a community what higher ed needs to be coming out of COVID, coming out of out of the the, the trump four years uh, coming out of the, this moment that we're in now um, and and this, this is incredibly consequential. I certainly hope so. I think Eddie and I are fighting for that that change to happen. Um, but but again, it will it will take these ideas getting some some purchase uh, in the marketplace that of of higher ed marketplace of ideas that is higher ed. Which yeah, I think that's the that's the challenge, right? So what happens after this moment? What happens over the next year, two years, three years, and so on? It, it, it's going to be very easy for a lot of institutions to just regress to a norm, um, even if that norm is different than it was in 2019. Um, it'll it'll still be um, kind of kind of pull, it has the potential of kind of pulling back to some assumptions of of where things need to settle that um, do not require a lot of change. Um, so PhD students mm -hmm. continuing to be taught uh, to do research and scholarship and not to teach at all. But we have an opportunity to try to think differently and, and to, to see some momentum that has been built up toward change, but also a, a huge population, the in, basically the entire population of faculty um, and students who've now had an experience that we can build on, that we can try to learn from, that we can do better in, um, in, in ways that you know we would never have been able to um, reach this many people and, and potentially acknowledge change in, in, in this kind of ubiquitous way without this. So, as sad as that is. Uh, what makes me the opposite of sad, but quite happy, is that you all have been fantastic guests and all of you involved in this conversation have been ferociously good participants. This has been a high octane, high intellect, provocative, thoughtful, reflective, and very useful conversation all in one hour. 
I'm I'm deeply grateful, deeply impressed. Uh, we have more questions and more comments to come. Um, but first, I, I want to I want to thank you, Josh. I want to thank you, Andy, both for being fantastic. Let me ask, uh, what are the best ways to keep up with uh, both of you these days? Uh, Josh, I pointed people towards your column and Inside Higher Ed. Um, is that where most of your brain is online these days? And, and Eddie and I um, write together in that space as, as much as possible as well. Uh -huh. ah, well that's good. And uh, Eddie, is, uh, is your collaboration with Josh, uh, both in books and on Inside Higher Ed columns, the best way for us to find you? Uh, I never, ever, ever leave this chair. So I think um, it's really easy to find me. I'm here 24 seven. I haven't left since March of last year. So but we, can't, we, we can't find you there in person. Uh, I see. So, um, well, thank you. Thank you both. And again, thank you everyone for uh, just a, a fantastic start for the year. I, I really appreciate this, but, but don't go um, because I, I have to point out that we are, uh, uh, I am going to publish the unasked questions and the uh, and the chat box after this, but also I just want to draw attention to where we're headed in the next few weeks. So just to remind you again that uh, if you like the Future Transform, we have more content coming for the next two and a half months. So you can see all this good stuff and you can sign up for it by going to tinyurl.com slash forum 2021. Um, if you want to join our book club and keep talking about this fantastic novel, there's the link for that. If you'd like to keep talking about these issues, the question of curriculum, the questions of inequality, the questions of the impact of the pandemic and so on, here are all kinds of venues for us in the social media. And if you want to go back into the past and look at our 235 recordings, including ones featuring Josh and Eddie, just go to tinyrollcom slash FDF archive. And above all, please everyone stay safe. This is an extraordinary time. I'm grateful to you for sharing the time with us and sharing your thoughts. Please take care and Happy New Year. Bye-bye.